Thank you. 
Good morning. It is pleasing to the Lord that we are gathered here to worship him and that many are gathered all over um, this nation and this world, even if maybe at different times today to worship the Lord. I would encourage you to take a moment to stand and greet those around you. And I would ask maybe even if it takes a couple of extra steps, say hi and introduce yourself to someone you might not know very well. Well, the psalmist wrote, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. So would you join me now in praising the name of the Lord together through song. As we prepare to sing, I'm going to ask you to take two things out. First, you'll need your hymnal. That's the red book that you can find underneath of the seat in front of you. And then you'll also want to keep the white insert from your worship folder close by. We'll go on to that shortly. We'll begin with number 64 in the hymnal, All Creatures of Our God and King. We'll sing stanzas one, two, and five, and we'll go right on to number 66. So be ready for that if you can. Some of you already are. Stand with me as we sing together. Yeah. 
In prayer, we declare the goodness of God and His awesomeness and thank Him for His power and we thank Him for His activity and work in our lives and we also take time to ask Him for help, to give us guidance, to give us wisdom, to bring us healing. We do want to be praying for the families of Maddie Stinnett and Paul Ely, both of those passed away over the last week and a half. Both of those had a rich relationship with Jesus, and they are where they ultimately wanted to be. So we give God thanks for their life, but we pray for their families as they grieve their passing. We want to also be in prayer for those who are facing devastation around the world, and most recently it looks like flooding has come to Utah and Colorado, so we'll be praying for those people there. We continue to pray for those in the involved in the cleanup efforts in eastern Kentucky and in western Kentucky. We've kind of been blessed here in the middle section of the state. Uh, may God continue to use us to reach out and help them as we can. We also want to pray for our world. The tensions of the world, Russia and Ukraine is just the one that captures the headlines, but there's many other places around the world where Satan is busy at work having people fight against one another and causing tension and hatred. We do give God thanks for a good trip to eastern Kentucky yesterday. Sent a crew down there, and they came back late last evening, had a wonderful time, ministered and helped people in a great way. We give God thanks for two marriages in particular, one John and Karen Oswald celebrated 60 years recently, and uh, Bob and Peg Thurman have passed the 72 mile marker of 72 years of life together. The flower here on the communion table is in honor of their marriage. The flower on the organ is in honor of the birth of Caroline Mabel Adams, born earlier this week to Laura and Wiley Adams. It's the granddaughter of Dennis and Denise. So we give God thanks for his goodness in this life. Our call to prayer is printed in your worship guide there. It's uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We're going to sing that together. And if you would like to come here and kneel at the altar and bring your praises and concerns and lay them out before Christ here, I invite you to do that. It's a good place to do it. Christ will hear you just as well in your seat as he will up here, that's for sure. But something special happens when we open ourselves in a unique way in his presence. And we join you in your prayers as you come forward to pray. Let's sing our call to prayer, and then we'll pray together. you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the privilege you have given us through prayer. It's a way to connect personally with you, a way to take everything that is inside of us and lay it out before you in an unvarnished manner. It's the way we open ourselves up to you and allow you to have full access to our inmost being. It's the way in which we prepare ourselves to join you in your plan for the world. It's the way that we take time to hear from you to make sure that we are living, walking, and talking as you want us to. It's also a way for us to be still, to be silent in your presence.
the opportunities and challenges of this past week finally came to an end. But that was only because we ran out of time and they have bled over into this new week. We are confident that before we get them resolved, more will be in line to take their place. The world keeps turning, and the waves of life keep churning. At times, they block everything else from view. We can't see anything other than what is swirling around us. But then there's a brief space of time where we can see daylight, a glimpse of something better and something more. In those moments, you speak your words of reassurance, comfort, and hope. You give us a boost of internal fortitude that empowers us to continue to forge ahead. When the waters seem to be drowning us, we know that you are there, but in those times, it is so hard to trust. It's difficult to remember that even though all seems to certainly be a loss, it seems like it's going to be a failure or just another period of eternal stress. In all of those times, you were there. Thank you for the times you break through and encourage us. Thank you for your words of reassurance that in spite of the noise of the frustration that we can hear, in spite of the noise of the frustrations around us. Thank you for those times you rebuke the tumultuous waves in our lives and you simply say, peace, be still. A lot of us are going through transitions right now. Life without a spouse, a new school year, a new job, increased care of a loved one, estranged family members, and even the hard news that it's over. Relationships, jobs, businesses, it's all done. You know who who is here this morning that needs to hear peace, be still. Would you speak those words over them this morning? We do celebrate with those who are celebrating many years of life together, and we pray for those whose marriages are struggling. We give you thanks for new life, and we pray for those who feel it slipping away. We give you thanks for your goodness to us, and we pray for those who are struggling to find hope. We give you thanks for providing for our needs, and we pray for those who are trying to make ends meet. We give you thanks for new chapters in our life, and we pray for those who have lost what was once dear to them. Our needs are many, but our praises are more. We offer them to you, for in the name of Christ we have prayed. Amen. Good morning, my name is Clive Campbell and I'll be reading the scripture today. Our scriptures are two and they can be found in 2 Chronicles 6, 32 through 33 and Acts 17, 22 through 28. Again, that's 1 Chronicles 6, 32 through 33 and Acts 17, 22 through 28. Please join me in standing for the reading of God's word. Even for the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your strong hand and outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this temple, may you hear in heaven in your dwelling place and do all the foreigner asks you. Then all the peoples of the earth will know your name to fear you as your people Israel do and know that this temple I have built bears your name. And now turn to Acts 17. 22 through 28. Paul stood in the middle of the Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. 
For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might see God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. The word of God for the people of God. Children, this is your time. Come on over here, would you? I'm just going to take that off for a minute. Do you, uh, do you like, I'm going to sit down here with you too. How many of you like to make stuff? Are you kind of crafty, you like to make things? I do. I like to build stuff. Yesterday, I had a little bit of time, so I decided that I was going to make myself a third arm. Have you ever done that? Yeah, neither have I. I, I. I thought, it could be very useful to have a third arm in hand, right? You know, you can hold three things instead of two things, so I thought, maybe I could make an arm. But I decided, I can't make an arm. You can't make an arm either, right? Yeah. Who makes arms? Who makes arms? Yeah, God makes arms doesn't he? And legs. But so I was looking at my own arm and I thought, it's just amazing when you think of your arm and your hand that we can't make anything like this, but God made this so we can grab things and we can ask questions and we can do all this stuff. But about 10 days ago, let me tell you what something happened to my arm. I was washing, I was helping my son wash his car and he has a sharp antenna sticking out of the back. It doesn't go all the way down in. And when I wiped there, I caught my arm on that sharp part of the antenna. Can you see what's left of it there? My cut? Anybody ever get a cut like that? You got one on your foot? Yeah. Yeah, just like that. This one was a lot longer 10 days ago, and I couldn't get it to stop bleeding. It just bled and bled. It got all in the sponge that I was washing the car. <laughs> it was sort of a mess. And I thought, how am I going to get this stopped? It finally did stop. And then it all, you know how they scab over, they get kind of crusty, you know. And now it's almost all healed, so you can barely see it. Right there on my arm. On the arm that God made. God made an arm that heals itself. Isn't that amazing? God not only made our arms and our hands, but God made us so that they heal themselves. I didn't have to do anything. I washed it, and that's it. Now, I can't make an arm, and you can't make an arm. But even if we could make an arm, we could never make an arm that could heal itself, could we? That's God's job. And think about that when people say, oh, this world just sort of came to be, just by chance. Nah, nah. There's no way that an arm and a hand just came to be, and particularly one that when they get hurt, they heal themselves. That's amazing. Lord, we thank, you for, for, we thank you for having an interest in making things, just like you've given a lot of us here. We all have that interest, and that's part of who you are. You were interested in making things. It's just that you make things so much more complex than we do and so much cooler. And we thank you uh, for our bodies. We thank you for the way you've made them. And we thank you for even when we hurt them, that you made them so that they'll heal. That all points to you, and we're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming up. You can go to children's worship if you are in third grade or under, okay? Would you take some time today and read through the announcements that are printed in the worship folder there? There's quite a, bit of, quite a few events coming up, coming up over the next several weeks. Uh, just two to highlight, the children and youth Choirs and musical are beginning soon, and the sign-up to participate in them are, is out um, 
in building B, right at the top of the stairwell, there's a little inset area, and there's a table there with some sign-up sheets on there. So if you have children or your youth and you want to participate in choirs and, and musical events, please sign up there. Also, there's an informational meeting today for those interested in Bible quizzing. That happens at 415 and B104, building, building B, lower level. Over in building C, out in the Great Hall, we have three tables over there with lost and found items, anything from a from a scooter to a Bible to a hat to a water bottle. Somebody's thirsty, somebody's not having their devotions, go, go over there. Uh, there's three tables of stuff that people have left here, so see if any of that is yours, and please take what is yours. Would you also take some time to complete the white communication card that's in your worship folder there? Drop it in the golden offering boxes as you leave here today. If you're a guest with us today, we'd love for you to complete that as well. But instead of putting it in the offering boxes out there, would you take it to the Welcome Center? We have a gift that we would like to be able to give to you, and that would give us the opportunity to do that. Giving of our financial resources is and has always been a part of Christian worship. The submitting of our property to the Lord's control helps us recall that He is the source and giver of every good gift. Whatever we give, physically through the golden boxes in the foyer or electronically, all of our giving is an act of praise and an act of thanks and an act of worship to God. Father, You have given us so much, and we are grateful for the opportunity to give back to You. We give our life our time, our acts of services, and our, our finances to you. We give it all for the building of your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Amy, very much. And and if you were in here for the uh, for the prelude, thank you to Josiah 
Saunders, where is he still here or did he leave? He might be coming to the next service, I don't know. To, to get a trombone, to get any musical instrument is difficult for me to have it sound good. <laughs> but a trombone is remarkable to me because it's all so relative. It's just where, you know, you're sharp or you're flat, depending on where you go, and you have to know where those notes are on that slide, and that is just, that is amazing to me. So good job, Josiah, wherever you are. Thank you. And to all trombone players everywhere, thank you. <laughs> Native. I want to think about that word just a little bit this morning. What's it mean? What's it mean to be native? Native is that tribe of people that uh, a couple years ago were discovered in Brazil. Remember that? They made a big deal about it. A completely, as far as anybody can tell, a completely uncontacted tribe in western Brazil in the jungle near Peru. They've never had contact with the outside world. They've never had electricity, they don't have cars, they don't have phones, they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have television. There is not a man or a woman or a child in that tribe who knows who Dwayne Johnson is, Jennifer Lopez is, Elon Musk is, Joe Biden is. Can you imagine that? A whole group of people, they took their picture from above as they happened to be flying over. They're natives to the Brazilian state of Acre, they're along the Envira River. They were born there, they were raised there, and they've never left. They belong there, natives. I wonder how many people here, if you'd be willing to say, how many people here are natives of Wilmore? You were born here and you were raised here. Anybody? Not me, I can't raise, look at that, wow. Just, if you raise your hand, oh, there you go, Sandy, there, there's a couple, two, three, two, in a group this size. Thank you for opening your town to the rest of us. <laughs> we appreciate that. Natives. Have you ever noticed the family of crows that live on this hill? Uh, where these buildings sit? From time to time, if you drive in, you can see them sitting on the ridge of the, the roofs of the buildings. Uh, on top of the light poles, they sit out there. They sit out on the sign. On top of the sign. They're not vultures. <laughs> They're crows. Uh, they're native to this hill. When we built our building here, we, we, sort of, we sort of bought their land out from under them because they couldn't get financing, but we could. Uh, so, you know, we might own the land, but they're the real natives of this hill. They were here long before these buildings were built, and if, if Jesus doesn't come back for a while, they're going to be here long after these buildings are gone. Webster says that a native is someone or something that belongs wherever it is because it was born there, it fits there, it's comfortable there, and there's a familiarity that says it's supposed to be there. Prayer, the desire and the ability to talk with God and to listen to God is native to human beings. Did you know that? Not to dogs, not to cats, not to parakeets, not to chimpanzees, to human beings. Prayer is native. It is not some extraneous addition that we add to human life. It is a natural function of human life. Because we're made in God's image, we have the innate desire to communicate, to speak spirit to spirit with our Creator. That is prayer. English author Samuel Johnson was once asked, what's the strongest argument for prayer? And he answered, there is no argument for prayer. It's like breathing. It's like eating. People do it simply because they're human. Prayer is native to humanity. Do you believe it? Do you believe that prayer is native to you? When the construction of the temple was finished, in that Chronicles passage that Clive read for us, King Solomon prayed a prayer of dedication that said this, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land, when he comes and prays, 
toward this temple. Solomon was assuming that any stranger coming from anywhere on earth would likely be a person who prays. About a thousand years after that, the Apostle Paul addressed the Areopagus, the ruling council of Athens, Greece. Those were the most influential, the most literate, arguably the most intelligent people of the city and of the culture. And Paul says to them in Acts 17, I've looked around your city and I see that you worship even an unknown God. You see, that urge to worship, that urge to pray, to communicate with someone beyond ourselves, it didn't even escape the most sophisticated minds of Athens. Prayer was native to them. Prayer has been present in some form in all peoples, in all places, in all ages. Buddhists don't believe in a God per se, and yet wherever you find Buddhism today, you find prayer. How do you explain that? Who are they praying to? Confucius was more or less an agnostic. He urged his followers to have nothing to do with the gods, small g. And yet Confucius himself is now more or less seen as a god that millions worship. Among the Khans of the Himalayas today, even though they're a tribe that are known for human sacrifice, you can hear in them the voice of prayer. You can read the prayers of the Aztecs. They're written on the walls that have been excavated. The Iliad opens with prayer. In Plato's words, every man of sense before beginning an important work will help, will ask for the help of the gods. Muslims pray formally five times a day, at least. Even the most committed atheist, when you put him into war, into the jaws of death, what happens? They want to pray. There's no atheist in a foxhole or in the hold of a sinking ship. Even the atheists on 9-11, they fought the urge to pray, and many of them unsuccessfully. Why? Because prayer is native to humanity. Prayer is native to you and to me. Fact is, unbelief lies in our opinions, not in our impulses. Our impulses push us to pray. When we are overwhelmed, when we're in crisis, when a heavy load of responsibility is suddenly dropped upon us, when things look hopeless for us, and especially when things look hopeless for someone we love or people that we love, our impulse is to pray. In a, in a church service in the deep south, one Sunday morning, a little boy was being especially loud and disobedient. And finally, his irate father slung him under his arm and carried him out of the sanctuary. And no one in the congregation so much as raised an eyebrow until as they left, the little boy cried out, Y'all pray for me now. <laughs> Unbelief is a luxury that lies in our opinions. Unbelief is up here. It's not in the impulses of the heart. And just like you can't have hunger without the existence of food, and you can't have breathing without the existence of air, you cannot have prayer without the existence of God. This native impulse to pray, this is what proves the reality of God. That's why Paul said to the people of Athens, this God that you worship, but that you don't know, let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about it. Let me introduce you to him. So, of course, prayer is native to humanity. No matter what our heads might think, our hearts understand. Sooner or later, our hearts understand the need to communicate with the God who made us. And so then the question becomes, what do we do with this native that lives within us? What do we do? Some have tried to deny its reality. Uh, some don't want to give in to prayer because the truth is they don't want to be burdened with the reality of the God that prayer points to. That's why they don't want to pray. 
You see, if a person gives into the reality of prayer, if she gives into the impulse of the heart to pray, then, then the question is, to what else might she have to give in? Who else might she have to admit is real and, and submit to? So because of pure selfishness and pride, some people deny the reality and the impulse of prayer within them. Other people will embrace prayer, but only in the face of extreme need. In moments of crisis or desperation, when they need help, only then will they pray. There's a pilot that was flying along, and suddenly the rudder of his plane malfunctioned. And he's in a panic, and so he radioed the tower, and he shouted, My rudder's malfunctioned, what do I do? And the air traffic controller radioed back, Now just keep calm, Captain, and repeat after me. Wing flaps, check. Velocity, check. Altitude, check. Everything checked out. The pilot made all the adjustments. The flight continued. Not five minutes later, the starboard engine stalled on his plane, and he radioed the tower again and shouted, now my starboard engine's out, what do I do? The controller rolled back, Captain, keep calm, repeat after me. Wing flaps, check. Velocity, check. Altitude, check. Pilot made the adjustments, and again the plane continued on course. Just a few minutes later, the pilot radioed the tower a third time. This time he shouted, mayday, both engines have gone, now what do I do? And the air traffic control radio back, Captain, keep calm and repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven, <laughs> hallowed be thy name. In cases like that, when we only pray in crisis situations, the God that that prayer points to is seen just as a power and not a person, you see. Which certainly isn't a Christian view of God. And it's not a Christian view of prayer. Now, now, don't get me wrong. God welcomes crisis prayer. But he calls us way beyond that. Crisis prayer is crude. And it's base. And it's uninformed. And it's untrained. And it's spasmodic. It, 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 it happens in fits and starts. And it's usually quite selfish. God, save me. It's like Samson prayed in Judges 16. His final prayer, at the end of his life, he was tied between the pillars in the arena, filled with Philistines, and, and he prayed, God, remember me and strengthen me once more so I can get revenge for my two eyes. You see, Samson knew God. Samson had faith. Samson prayed. But isn't there a higher plane of prayer than that kind of occasional prayer for our own self-needs? If Samson, I think, had been praying, if he'd been talking with and listening to God all along, he likely wouldn't have been in the position he was in. There between those pillars. Isn't there a higher plane of prayer, of talking with God, than this occasional prayer, Lord, save me, help me? There is. There is. And Jesus' life shows us this. On the cross, Jesus could pray, Father, forgive them. He didn't pray, Father, save me. Father, help me. Father, relieve me from this pain. Father, take this away from me. He did pray that, but not on the cross. On the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. Forgive those who are crucifying me right now, for they know not what they're doing. That's a different kind of prayer, isn't it? That's a different kind of prayer. It's a higher plane of prayer than just this erratic prayer for self. Stephen's life says there's a different kind of prayer. As he was being stoned to death, Stephen prayed for those throwing the rocks. He said, Lord, don't hold this sin against him. That's a different kind of prayer. That's the depth of relationship. That's the degree of communication, the kind of prayer that God wants to share with us. That's how prayer is supposed to be. Imagine a father. He has two sons. The first son only looks to his dad as a last resort in times of his own 
need. He never invites his dad to, to coffee just to talk. He never asks his advice. He never wants his help in small difficulties. He never shares any times of joy with his dad. So he grows up that way. He goes off to college, and his dad only hears from him when he wants money. And after school, he lives his life with utter disregard for his father's character and purpose. He just turns to him from time to time when he's desperate, when he's made a mess and he needs help. That's the first son. The second son, however, the second son sees in his father this love and this wisdom. And that becomes the motivating factor in his life. And he's aware of what his dad has done for him and has given to him. And his gratitude pushes him to please his father. His father is his friend. And he confides in his father. And he's advised by his father. And he keeps close to his father. And in crisis, he comes to his father with a naturalness that comes with this long habit he's had of communicating with him. He knows he's loved. He's comfortable talking often with his dad about big things, about small things. Is there any doubt as to which kind of relationship God wants to have with us? Is there any doubt that God wants us to be the second son? And it all begins and it ends with prayer. God the Father sent his son so that we might know him as our father and as our creator. Jesus died so you and I might be able to pray. And one of the most tragic things I would think we could do is squander that gift, (laughs) that gift we've been given. One of the saddest things we could do is, is to leave prayer as this occasional, untrained, sporadic tendency in our lives. Our Heavenly Father wants us to know him. He wants to pour his blessings out upon us. The question is, will we know him? Will we communicate with him? Will we discipline ourselves and work with God's Holy Spirit to develop this native prayer in in our soul? We're going to be talking about how to do that for, for a few weeks because we all want to be the second son. If you're following Jesus here today, you want to be the second son. Uh, So let's take our prayer lives to the heights and to the depths that God intended. And let's be like Jesus in that. I will say this, though, if if you're here this morning and you don't know this Jesus, uh, you need to know that he is God's son who came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He was killed. But then he was raised up again by God the Father to set us free from our bondage to sinful things and sinful behavior. And this Jesus, he will save your soul today if you will just admit that you need him, if you'll believe in him by faith. And there's actually a simple prayer written at the bottom of the backside of this worship folder that will guide you. It's not a, it's not a magic prayer. It's just guiding you through the words that say, Jesus, I need you and I need forgiveness. And if you will pray that with your heart, and if you will mean it, you can have eternal peace with God. Now, if you already know Jesus, uh, then over these next few weeks, would you seek him? Would you be willing to seek him for a deeper prayer life? Will you ask him to teach us, both both individually and together as as a, a church family, what he wants us to learn about communicating with him? What he wants us to learn about prayer. Will you you pray that prayer? Before you agree, let me me fully disclose something to you. It's kind of dangerous to ask God to teach you to pray. George Herbert said, he who wants to learn to pray, let him go to sea. (laughs) And the truth is God might just take us to sea. Uh, Or to heartbreak or to sickness or to poverty, God might take us to disappointment if you ask him to teach you to pray, or to frustration, maybe even to war, 
Those are typically the places that God takes people who truly want to learn to pray. It's like when we ask God to teach us patience. You know, what happens? He introduces this annoyance into our lives that we can't get away from. More often than not, that's how he does it. When we truly ask him to teach us to pray, he usually takes us down a rough road. So the road may get rough, full disclosure. Fact is, the road may already be rough for you today. But remember that wherever he takes us, he's there with us. And he's there to hear, and he's there to listen, and he's there to respond. So again, will you ask God to teach us individually and together how to pray? I'm not saying that you should pray, God, teach him how to pray. <laughs> teach me how to pray. Teach us how to pray. To pray more, to pray better, so that a month from now we'll pray more effectively and we'll know our Father more completely. And we'll all be more like the second son. More like Jesus in the way we communicate with our Father in heaven. Prayer is native to us. It's our native practice. We were made to pray. So, so let's come and sit and let's talk to our Heavenly Father for a while. Because he has so much he'd like to say. He has so much he'd like to say. Lord, would you help us? to come to you as the second son and as your one and only son, Jesus. Would you make prayer this native thing that resides within us? Would you help it to become, would you help our communication with you and our communion with you to become so natural and so real? Do what you need to do within us. We pray for that to happen. And help us be open to you for where you want to take us in the journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song of response is going to be number 425 in your hymnal. 425, it's a song that talks about spending time with the Lord. It's in the garden. And if you can, would you stand with me as we sing these words together?
made a discovery the last couple days, and that is there are very few hymns, songs, that talk of prayer with much more than um, the satisfaction of our own needs. If you look through the hymnal or the, whatever songbook you choose, uh, most of the songs of prayer talk about coming to God when we're sick, when we're tired, when we're, you know, and asking something from. This is one of the very few that talk about prayer as God talking to us and it being a pleasant and beautiful experience. I think that's the fuller image of prayer that Jesus certainly practiced and that God wants from his people, his church. So let's uh, learn how to do that together. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to do that. Thanks for coming to worship today. Go in peace. Amen.